whether you're watching online or here in the auditorium with us thank you for carving out some time out of your schedule to be with us this summer weekend my name's Dean I'm the campus pastor here and I just wanted to let you know that we have a great lineup for you tonight a lot of fun things happening right here in this service tonight I want to let you know that next weekend though during our six well actually this is the sixth week of our summer at Church on the Move on the seventh weekend which is next weekend, our Love Day Outreach Finder opens up. And if you haven't been a part of what we're doing here, I'm, I want you to know that Love Day is a chance for you to get involved in sharing the love of Jesus with your community, maybe your business, maybe a nursing home near you. We have a bunch of outreaches already lined up, and it's your chance to just go and serve the people of your community. So I encourage you, get involved with that. 
we have a lot of cool things available for you to go and do neat things so check that out you can go to cotm.info and get all the information there let me go ahead and do this i want to go ahead and welcome all of our first time guests tonight if you are here tonight and you're here for the first time thanks for coming we're honored to have you. You're part of the family. We're glad to have you with us. And we would love to know that you're here. Would you take just a moment, grab that little connect card in the seat back in front of you, fill that out. It'll take you less than 30 seconds. Then bring it out into the lobby. We have two first-time guest kiosks. We have some really friendly folks out there who would love to meet you, shake your hand, and give you a gift. We've prepared something in your honor. It's just a small token of our appreciation for your coming. We had 30 first-time guests last weekend. You come all the time, and we're honored to have you. So thanks for coming out tonight. Also, I wanted to let you know that tonight, right after this service, if you haven't been to a movie on the lawn, this is a perfect night to go. We have one right up here at our 180 campus. We're showing Despicable Me 3. If you haven't seen that, it is a funny family movie. Make sure you grab your kids, go on up. We've got free popcorn, and then they're gonna also have some hot dogs, chips, soda on the lawn. It's a great time to just get together as a family and have a great time together. Well, we're doing something kind of out of the box around here this weekend. We have seven different speakers for the seven different services that we're doing this weekend as Church on the Move. We have three different speakers for this campus, two for 180, and two out at South. And I'm telling you, tonight, you're going to really enjoy Angie Wood's story. Angie's going to be, yeah, yeah. They're looking forward to this. They're expecting good things. I'm telling you, Angie's got a great story. She's been here most of her life, as far as I know, serving, giving. She's got a great story. You're going to really enjoy that. But before we get all of that, we have two more songs. We want you to stand up. We want you to lean in. And let's have a good time tonight. As a matter of fact, turn around, greet someone, let them know you're glad to see them at church, and then let's get on with it.
Is your faithfulness? I will. 
Amen. It's so good to be reminded how much our God loves us. Amen. Thank you for singing with us and singing loud. You can have a seat. We're going to continue in an attitude of worship this morning as we give, as we bring our tithes and offerings to God. And if you would like to give with us today, there are two ways that you can do that. There's an offering envelope in the seat back in front of you. You can also give online. There's instructions on the screen right now. You can go to cotm.info on your smartphone. Very easy, fast, secure way to give there. And for all of you that give on a weekly, monthly basis, thank you so much. Thank you for being faithful. Let's take what we're going to give in our hands and let's pray. God, God, we're in awe of you today. How much you love us despite the things that we know about ourselves. You accept us. You call us your sons and daughters. God, we couldn't be more grateful. Thank you for allowing us to partner with you in your kingdom as we give of our finances. God, we want to be a part of what you're doing in Tulsa and through this church. God, take what everyone gives today, bless it, so that more and more people can hear the story of the real Jesus. It's in that beautiful name everyone said. Amen. What's up, Church on the Move? Oh, come on. That was, that was pathetic. Your Church on the Move, people. Come on. We could do better than that. What's up, Church on the Move? How you doing Saturday night? There you go. Life. Man, you, how, how do we sing these songs and not respond with life, right? This is our God. This is our Jesus. Hey, it's good to see you guys tonight, man. Great to be here. This is an exciting weekend. I've been looking forward to this weekend for a long time. We're doing something we have never done in the history of our church. We're having a different speaker for every service at every location. And that's, I think that's pretty cool. And it's not because I wasn't available to speak. As you can see, I'm here. I could speak. My dad could speak. But we, we're doing this strategically. We're doing this because how many of y'all know there's some amazing people at Church on the Move? And a lot of them, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of them, you don't really ever get to see. They're kind of behind the scenes. But I'm telling you, there are some men and women of God who I get to work with every day. And I, I work with a lot of these people, and I hear them like they challenge me. In fact, a lot of them that are speaking this weekend, they help me write my sermons. And so they're giving me content. And half the stuff I say, I didn't even come up with. Somebody on our staff did. And I'm like, that's awesome. You, you should get up there and speak. And so that's what we're doing this weekend. We've got some amazing communicators that are just like, we're going to give them a chance to get up here and share their real Jesus stories with you. And tonight, I am so excited because Angie Woods, one of Heather and I's greatest and dearest friends and kind of a battle, uh, like a, a fellow warrior, she's been working with me for so long. She's going to get to speak to you guys tonight. She started with me way back in 180, back in the day. She'll show you a few of those photos here in a minute, just kind of tell you a little of her story. But she started with me back in 180, and then we went to do arts together, and so all the Christmases and the big productions and all that, man, Angie was like my right-hand person pulling all of that off. But what I love more than anything about Angie is her passion for you, her passion for this church, and her passion for introducing people to the real Jesus. She has a real deep walk with God that just pours out of her anytime you get to be around her and listen to her talk. And so she's going to come and share a little of her real Jesus journey. But how many of y'all know it's not easy standing on this stage? Like this is a big platform. It's a little freaky being up here. And so what we want to do this weekend, and this is just kind of who we are as a church. We want to intentionally celebrate the gifts that God has put in people. And so we're going to lean in tonight. We're going to listen. We're going to take notes like this was like she's the greatest speaker that has ever showed up at Church on the Move. We're going to treat her with honor and respect because that's the gift that's inside of her. We're excited to hear from it and hear a little of her story. So would you help me? Welcome to the stage, my friend, my partner, Angie Woods, everybody. You guys, you guys, <laughs> oh my gosh. 
gosh. I love you so much. You got to sit down. You're freaking me out. I'll tell you who's freaking me out is Whit George because that introduction is supposed to be on video and we practiced it on video and then he just came up here live and did that. How are you guys? <sighs> this is really fun. I have been looking forward to this. You know, Whit asked all of us to share our real Jesus journey and I'm excited about that. Uh, I am nervous about that, I'll be honest, probably for the same reason that you would be nervous if you were up here in my shoes. Um, but honestly, I have never really felt like I have all that dramatic or glamorous of a story. Because you guys, Dean said it, Whit said it, I'm a church chick, like through and through. I was uh, born and raised in a Christian home and I gave my life to Christ. Honestly, when I was really, really little, I uh, got baptized in my parents' small church in Grove, Oklahoma, in a horse trough. That's a real church chick, you guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I grew up in church every time the doors were open, we were here. And honestly, I've always been really passionate about the things of God. I've always loved his house. I have always wanted to be a part of it. In fact, um, when I was growing up, for as long as I can remember, all I ever really thought was, God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You know, you have a plan and a purpose for me, and I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a messenger for him and a rallier of the troops. I was in 100%. Uh, I worked at Dry Gulch Summer Camp. Uh, you guys are here tonight, right? Yes! Welcome, I love you guys. You treated my girls so beautifully a couple weeks ago. They told me all about you, all about you. Um, but yeah, I was a camp counselor, and like what said, I started working at 180 uh, back in 2000. So I've been around for a long time. Um, but I brought some old pictures just for interview, have been around for a long time as well. This is an old 180 drama sketch. That's my husband dressed as Jesus. Uh, that's Chris Munch. He's the antagonist in this Easter sketch. He's the Easter bunny. That's why he has a cigarette in his hand. And <laughs> I am the Easter chicken, which I don't really remember what that was. But uh, let's see the other ones. I brought some other photos. That is from a Christmas ages ago. That's Sam and I. Let's go to the next one. Uh, that's Andy, Chris, and I singing 90s worship songs together. I think we look pretty good. We should start a band. Uh, is there one more? Oh, Mother's, oh, that's an announcement slide. Guys, I spent 27 years of my life doing announcements at Church on the Move. Uh, and then I think there's one more. Uh, yeah, Mommy Rhapsody. Some of you guys maybe saw that online. <laughs> I was always really, really passionate about doing big things for God. I really wanted to be a part of that. And so I started doing big things for God at a really early age. But I'm also kind of a passionate and driven kind of type A personality, kind of an achiever. Do we have any other type A achievers in the room? Come on, this is church on the move. We know how to do. We know how to get our hustle on, right? That's totally the way that I'm wired. And achievement for me has always had this kind of exchange to it. I do and do and I take on a new project, and I achieve something that I set out to do. And on the back end of that, there's like this really great sense of satisfaction. It's a lot of fun for me because I love to do things for God. And so there's a really fun kind of fast pace to achievement for me. It's also just really makes me happy. I love doing a lot for God. But if I'm uh, honest for, with you, uh, I would tell you that I was happy doing all kinds of things for God for a little over a decade in my life until I wasn't. And I think the problem that for me was that somewhere along the line, um, my doing for God became way more valuable than just my being with God. And I wish I could tell you a story here, honestly. I wish I could tell you like a moment where the light came on and it kind of clicked for me and I knew that the attitude of my heart was sort of drifting. But I think that's a really tough part of a story like mine, a real Jesus journey like mine, because it wasn't so external, it was way 
more deeply internal than that for me. So I would do and do and do and achieve, and eventually that exchange started dropping off for me. And I started feeling like I wasn't getting out of that what I used to. My heart can feel that. And so every time I miss that exchange, honestly, over a really long period of time, the attitude of my heart drifted. And I'll tell you how it progressed. It went from, this is really frustrating, to, man, this isn't fair. And then I felt really dissatisfied. I felt like I was kind of feeling used, feeling exhausted until I was feeling hurt. And then I think the best way I could describe it for you was that where the attitude of my heart ended up was just like kind of a low grade anger that was kind of sitting beneath the surface in my life. And there was one night I remember in particular I couldn't sleep. I was kind of tossing and turning, stewing. You know how we stew in the night. My husband was in bed already. And so I got up out of bed and I decided I was going to go out into the garage and I was going to have like a real conversation with God. I went out there. Our girls were really little at the time. They were asleep. I didn't want to wake anybody up. So I went out there and my conversation with God sounded a little bit like this that night. God, I am so angry right now and I don't know where this came from but I have been doing and doing and doing and I, God I am exhausted and I cannot seem to get the happiness and the satisfaction out of all this doing for you that I used to get and you're the one that asked me to do all of this I'll tell you what was the most alarming thing for me guys is that I'm a follower of Christ. And maybe the biggest marker that you could put on the life of a Jesus follower is what? Joy? I had none. I was so angry that night in that conversation with God. God, look at all these years that I've been doing and doing and doing. What do you want? I couldn't really see it at the time. In hindsight, I can see a little more clearly now what God was stirring in my life. But my conversation with him that night, it was almost identical to another conversation that Jesus records in a parable that he told in John's Gospel, chapter 15. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, I'm sorry. It's the parable of, of the prodigal son. I know all of us know this story, but I'll go quickly through a recap. But the younger brother, you know, there's a father and a younger brother. Yo the younger brother comes to the father and he says, can I have my inheritance early? He gives him the money. The younger brother turns his back and he runs from his father. He squelches the wealth. He makes foolish decisions. He ends up on his knees eating pig slop, the scripture says. And all of us could probably look at the story of the younger brother. We could point and go, look, we see his actions. We see his sin. That's sin, isn't it? The younger brother decides, I've blown it. And he turns back and he comes back to the father. The father, we all love this story. The father goes out to him with open arms. He receives him. He forgives him. He decides to throw him a massive party. And so... All, you know, they're going to kill the fat calf, which means they're having like steaks on the grill and everybody's invited. But the, the older brother, he's the other character in the story. And I relate a lot more to the older brother than I do the younger brother because he stayed close to the father. He never turned his back and sprinted away. He never made all these external choices that you could point out and go, that, that sin. He stayed close to the father. The parable says, what Jesus shares, is that when the younger brother came back to the father, the older brother wasn't there. He was out in the field doing for his father. And he comes back and he sees all the commotion, he hears the music, sees all the people. He asks one of the servants, hey, what's going on? The servant says, oh, your brother's home. Your father is thrilled and he's killed the fat calf. We're having a party tonight. And let's look at what happens. The older brother and Luke Chapter 15, verse 28. 
This is his response. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Why is he angry? Like, what is it that's simmering in his life at that time? Like, what, why that emotional response when your own flesh and blood returns home? So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father and said, Look, at all these years I have been slaving for you. And you never disobeyed. I never disobeyed your orders yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Why is he upset? He feels robbed, he feels cheated, like this exchange is not fair for him, which is exactly how I felt. His brother did nothing and got everything in exchange. He has done and done and done everything. And he feels like he's getting nothing. My conversation with God at midnight in my garage that night was eerily similar to his words. God, look at all these years I've been doing for you. It was in that moment in the garage that I realized that I had placed a really disproportionate value on some things in my life. All in the name of God. And that was the start, I would say, of my real Jesus journey. It wasn't the end, but it was the very beginning because God was just about to get in to my heart and uproot some values that I held really, really dearly. And he replaced them with something so much better. So I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about three values that God uprooted in my life. The first one is this. I valued independence instead of total dependence on God. You know, the heartbeat of independence is, I don't need anybody. I got this. I got really good ideas. I got my own way, and I don't need anybody. It's good old-fashioned self-righteousness, right? And I'm serious. I mean, I'm an older brother. That's the tendency of the older brother way. We prefer to work hard and earn our own righteousness. What I was after was achievement. Man, I wanted to do big, big stuff for God, but my thing was... I wanted to do it on my own, even if it meant, God, I don't need you in this. In John chapter 15, Jesus talks about a more kingdom-minded way of, of thinking about achievement. It was different than my independent version. He uses some different language here. He talks about being fruitful. He's giving us a word picture just so we can really understand how much he wants us to depend on him. He opens by saying, Jesus is the vine. God is like a gardener. So God as a gardener has the ability to lift up the branches that don't have enough sunlight to really bear fruit. He's also got the ability to trim away and prune so that you can bear more fruit that way. This is what it says in John 15, verses 4 and 5. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It was probably those last seven words that night in the garage for me that I felt like God really brought to my remembrance. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't remember overthinking things too much. I don't remember making a precise decision that night in the garage. I just know that my really angry prayer in a moment turned into a complete and total surrender on my knees. I think it was maybe the first time I had been on my knees as an adult, really needing God. But I told him that he could have everything that I loved. I told him that he could have all of my ambitions and all of my dreams. And I can tell you guys, I had some pretty big dreams. And that was so scary because, I mean, I started working and doing for God in ministry vocationally When I was really young, the last job I had, I was a waitress. 
So it was really scary to say, God, like, what does this mean? Like, I, I guess I'll do anything? What? Okay. But what does this mean? And I'm telling you, all the voices in my head were screaming, do not make this big of a commitment. But in that moment, on my knees at midnight in the garage, I saw my pride. And I saw my sin for the very, very first time. I valued achieving independently, but a kingdom-minded achievement, what Jesus calls bearing fruit, is not a self-serving, self-righteous independence. I can only have dependence on Jesus. The second value that I want to talk about tonight is I valued bearing the weight instead of sharing the weight. And what I'm talking about here is friendship. And I don't mean like Facebook followers or exchanging pleasantries in the hallway at church or out on a baseball field. I'm talking about what Wit talks about often. Who knows your story? Who knows your struggles? And who knows your secrets? If I'm being really transparent tonight, I'm just going to tell you guys I am really good at shallow end of the pool relationships. And I'm an extrovert, and I love people, but a couple weeks ago my friend sent me this link that just said a few like uh, special things about my particular personality, and one of the things made me laugh out loud because it said, you may love people, you may be super energized being around a lot of people, but you are so not an open book. And that is me, I'm not naturally an open book. I'm a pro at keeping people at a distance because I prefer and I value bearing the weight of my life alone. But that night in my garage, God showed me the sin of my pride and I knew that I had isolated myself, which is classic older brother behavior. Thinking that it's absolutely the best to go it alone. And so I called my friend, and I attempted to tell her what God was kind of stirring in my heart. And, you know, I, I was in the garage, and I, I think I'm isolated, and I was trying to tell her what was going on. And she had this really grand idea with almost zero hesitation. She invited me to join her women's small group circle. And I did not want to do that. I'll tell you why. With a drive for achievement like I have, I have often not had time for people that don't contribute to my achieving. And so when my friend Jamie asked, come and do this small group, I couldn't help but have the attitude in my mind that was just like this. What's in it for me? I mean, I'm gonna go sit and try to open my life. I already know I'm bad at that. I'm gonna be super awkward. I'm gonna bumble and fumble all over myself and I work at the church, so that's gonna be weird. I'm not good at deep relationships. They're not easy for me. All of the voices in my head are screaming yet again. You know what I think that was? I can see it in hindsight. It was all of my pride and all of my loneliness just wrestling it out. And I'm not good in this moment at deep relationships. I feel like I fumble and I bumble and I cry and I make people feel awkward and sometimes I get upset and I get my feelings hurt because I'm a feeler in a really big way. And any, regardless of all of that, I thought about it, I prayed about it, and I told my friend that I was in. And I will tell you that that particular small group, if I just had to narrow it down and say, when did you meet the real Jesus? I would say, no doubt about it. I met the real Jesus when I was in that small group. But I'll also tell you that that small group circle was one of the most challenging things I have ever done. 
because I felt terrible at this. I, I, I didn't feel like I was very good at relationships. But the very next semester, I led a group super awkwardly. <laughs> and then the next semester, I led another group, guys, super awkwardly. But every time I keep going at it, no matter how awkward I feel, I, am, I tell you, I am getting better. At least I'm getting more honest about it. I saw a video, uh, I follow an artist from Hillsong, she's a songwriter and a worship leader there, but she posted this video the other day, uh, it's a couple weeks ago, but it so deeply resonated me when I saw it. The video is a little silly because it's of panda bears, and so I'll let you watch the video a little bit first. But she made a really beautiful connection. <laughs> you guys, this is how I feel trying to love people in a deep and intimate way. <laughs> I feel bumbly and fumbly and my leg is caught in the slide and I don't know. <laughs> but she paired this quote with it and listen, every day I put love on the line. There's nothing I'm less good at than love and yet I decide every day to set aside what I can do best and attempt to do very clumsily. Open myself to the frustrations and failures of loving, daring to believe that failing in love is better than succeeding in pride. I'm not perfect at deep relationships, but I so need a place to process what God is doing in my life or I can't even see it. I need a place to listen and to care for people who don't contribute to my achieving. And I need a place to learn how to be cared for, not because I earned it, but just because. God uprooted that value of bearing the weight of my life on my own. The third thing is um, I valued the external work of my hands instead of the internal posture of my heart. A drive for achievement the way that I have, it has a way, honestly, of just trickling into almost every area of your life. And for me, my drive for achievement even trickled into the way that I spent time with God. And so this is what I mean, external work of my hands. Did my hands open the Bible today? Yes, check. Did my hands fold in prayer today? Yes, check. Did my hands lift in worship this weekend at church? Yes, check. The external like the younger brother had all the external choices. It can be the same here. The external actions are all there, all of them. Those disciplines like reading scripture, praying, worship at church, all of that stuff, those disciplines, they have not been perfect. I'm not saying they've been perfect, but they've been in my life for a really long time. But what I felt like, like God started to uproot in me and started challenging me in was, Angie, when we sit down and do this, like, where are you? Where's the posture of your heart? I really struggled with the language of this particular thing because I feel like anytime you start talking about the heart, like, it can get really fruity and feely and it's like, what the heck am I supposed to do with that? And so my favorite scripture to kind of combat that, it's maybe the most concrete way that I see in scripture to describe the tendency of my heart. It's Jeremiah 17, 9, and he says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Centuries later, one of my favorite hymns of all time was written, and he says the same thing that Jeremiah said. He says it slightly different. He says it like this. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. 
centuries later, 1998, a slightly more modern day prophet, Lauren Hill from the Fugees. I knew you guys were my people. She said it like this, how are you gonna win when you ain't right within? What are Jeremiah, the writer of the hymn, and Lauren Hill from the 90s all saying? They're all saying the exact same thing. Our external actions and behaviors aren't enough. We need a heart change, and we're not equipped to see it on our own. David, in the Psalms, he offers a, a prayer. I think it's a really bold prayer. But it's a prayer for the high achiever like me, and if you are one too, I hope you take hold of it tonight. But it's, it's a bold prayer that cannot help but get your eyes off of the external work of your hands and focus them more deeply on the internal posture of your heart. And it's simple, but it's this. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I'm going to tell you from personal experience that this is a dangerous prayer to pray. You better be real about it because when, when I got real about praying that prayer and I slowed down, and that's like a whole nother conversation because a high achiever likes to run, run, run super fast, but I had to learn how to slow down and stop treating my time with God like something to achieve in the morning. But when I slowed down and made space for God to speak, he really showed up. I'll just tell you, he turned the lights on in the dark places of my heart. He removed the blinders from my eyes so I could see the wanderings of my heart. And it's not very fun. It's a little bit hard, honestly. Because personally, for me, what I saw was how worthless my efforts were to create my own righteousness. It's so empty. But I'll tell you the really, really cool thing, and this is the beauty of the gospel and the way it's come to life for me personally. But he didn't leave me there, down in the dumps just feeling like a total piece of trash that can't get anything right, that's when I met the real Jesus. Because he came in and he filled the gap. He showed me his grace. He showed me his love. He made it so real to me. And for the first time ever, I saw myself as desperate for him. That's where it all happens. I used to read the Bible for me with the same attitude that I went to JJ about the small group. What's in it for me? God, I've got my agenda. I've got my dreams. I've got my things that I'm trying to achieve. Just give me something. That's how I used to show up. I couldn't see it at the time. I used to show up in prayer like this. God, I got a lot to do. I really do, and it's all for you, and so I'm really going to need you to show up and give me a little assistance. It's ugly. This is the ugliest part and the part I didn't want to share, but I'm going to share it. I used to worship, I think with good intentions, you guys. But I used to worship right here. God, Jesus, thank you for dying for them. I love this cause. I will go with you. Thank you for dying for them. Let's me and you go out and save them together. It's ugly. But this prayer that David prayed, it finally, I mean, I've been walking with God, like I said, since I was a little tiny girl. But guys, it was more about duty for me than it was delight. When I started getting real and praying that prayer for real and inviting God in and slowing down and making time for him to speak, he started turning the lights on for me and saying, look, look, 
look. Look at your sin. Look at your pride. This prayer for me put a new heart posture on old disciplines in my life. And it changed the game. Now I show up to scripture just for him. I show up not to read it and try to get something out of it, but honestly, it feels a lot more like it's reading me. Because it points out what I need to hit my knees, not just one time at midnight in the garage in my entire life and call it done. Guys, we're called to a life of surrender. Over and over, over and over. Are you ready to prayer that, pray that prayer that David prayed? Are you ready to go there with God? It's kind of scary, but I'll tell you, it's the greatest adventure I've ever been on. My real Jesus journey isn't over, and I would be ridiculous to think that it is. It's not over. And you know, I told you earlier, I'm not like the younger brother with all the external things. I, it, this was so deeply internal for me that I, that I had no joy and I, I had no satisfaction and I was striving and driving at all of this doing. It was exhausting. My, my journey is not external, it's internal. It's not anything that you could take a picture of and post on Instagram and say, look at the life change. But I'll tell you one last story just to highlight, and it's so subtle, but I share it only because if you are an older brother, and maybe tonight you thought, oh, I've never seen myself, but yeah, I'm an older brother too. I'll just share this story for you, just for you. But this been semester, you know, months ago, maybe a year, I don't know how long ago, several semesters ago, my small group was learning how to um, meditate on a small passage of scripture. We were using some questions and a journal, and we were really, really trying to learn how to do that. And one day I was walking from this building to the other building across the parking lot. I make that walk often to go meet with different teams, and uh, maybe one, sometimes two times a day I make that walk. And usually for me, that walk across the parking lot was just this little moment alone to escape to all of my anger. And I'm not really doing anything, I'm just walking, I'm moving to a meeting or whatever, and so I just let my mind wander to how dissatisfied I am and how angry I am, and I'm just meditating. Maybe I had a conversation that really upset me and frustrated me, so I'm rehearsing all those conversations again and saying, well, next time I'm gonna say this, and next time I'm gonna say that. And it's just a moment, it's just a little escape it's just a little getaway to go visit my anger. That's what that walk across the parking lot is for me. But on this day, instead of escaping there, I found myself thinking about my time with God that morning. We were reading through Psalm 1, and I, I found myself just going, wow, I've never seen that about the Lord before. That's really cool. Man, God, I'm so grateful you pointed out that sin this morning. I've never talked to you about that. I'm glad that we talked about that. And I was just talking, and this is so subtle, you guys. If I wasn't describing it, this would be a ridiculous story to try and convey. But I was walking, and this is the external action that happened. <laughs> God, you're so good. You are so good. And I don't think that the Holy Spirit has elbows, but he did nudge me that day. In that moment, he was just like, Angie, can you feel that? Because I think all that striving and driving that you were trying to get joy and peace and contentment and satisfaction, you had to work for all of that and you exhausted yourself. But in that moment, it wasn't coming from anything I did. Get it? I didn't earn it. I certainly didn't deserve it, but he gave me joy from within. Have you ever heard, I've got a river of life flowing out of me? It's so subtle. It's so subtle, but it was such an internal 
journey that my heart took over so many years, four or five years maybe of the slow drift away, even though I was right here in close proximity, right in the midst of the things of God, my heart drifted slowly. And then as I invited him in, I got joy, the joy of my salvation returned. Psalm 16, 11 says this, you make, me know, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. I don't have a big flashy moment external kind of story. I met the journal, the real Jesus over a long journey. I met the real Jesus when I finally came to the end of myself. I met the real Jesus awkwardly in small group after small group after small group after small group. I met the real Jesus when I slowed down and genuinely asked him to search my heart. I brought one last lyric that I wanna read. This has been a meaningful old hymn for me as I've been walking this journey. But I don't think there's a better way to point at Jesus and how he takes the place of all my striving. He already did the work. The hymn is called, It Is Finished, and I'll read it. Nothing, either great or small, nothing, sin or no. Jesus died and paid it all long, long ago. When he from his lofty throne stooped to do and die, everything was fully done. Hearken to his cry. Weary, working, burdened one, wherefore toil you so? Cease your doing, all was done long, long ago. Lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him, in him alone, gloriously complete. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love for us. When we were at our worst, when I was at my worst, God, you came after me. And I don't think I realized, Lord, in the moment of how angry I was and how dissatisfied I was, it didn't feel like you were pursuing me, but I see it now, God, it was your love pursuing me and I'm so grateful God tonight if there are any older brothers as I referred to them earlier if there are any older brothers in the room God give them the courage to pray the prayer that David gave us give them the courage tonight this week to utter those words and to genuinely slow down and invite you in God we're not equipped to see the wandering of our hearts alone. We need your truth in here. So thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy, God. I'm so desperate for it every day of my life. Thank you for our time together tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. I wanna pray one more prayer. Um, tonight, we pray this prayer every time that we gather together. We just call it the believer's prayer because you might be here tonight and you might think, I've got kind of that dutiful relationship with God. And I've got a lot of head knowledge, but I've never like really taken that relationship down into my heart, into the posture of my heart. Maybe you've never, ever invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Maybe you're more like the younger brother tonight. We're going to pray this prayer. We're all going to pray it together. I invite you to join in. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. Thank you for your love. I recognize, Lord, that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I recognize that you are a Savior worthy of following. So Jesus, right now, I ask you into my life, 
change me from the inside out. I believe you died on a cross for my sin and you rose from the grave. Lord, change me in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a hand clap for everybody that just prayed that prayer. I love you guys so much. Thank you for letting me share. Give her a big hand clap. Man, that was awesome. That was awesome. While you're, while you're standing, I, I just want to acknowledge that that was one of the most heartfelt presentations that I believe I've ever heard. She did an amazing job. But I want to say this to you. If you would bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment, because I want to give the, a chance to the people in this room, many, like she said, who may be older brothers. This may not be the first time that you had prayed that prayer, but you prayed it again because you know that your heart had wandered that you had, like she said, you had taken some steps towards anger, towards external workings. And God wants you to know it's a work of the heart. It's, a, it's an internal posture. Many of you made an adjustment of that internal posture tonight. And we would love to know that. We want to help you on this journey. Like she said, it's the greatest adventure that you'll ever be on, ever. So it's important that you let somebody know. If you'll grab that little connect card in the seat back in front of you, just fill it out. Bring it out to our connect table. We would love to walk on this journey with you. We have some resources that will help you. We'll help you get on a small group. We'll help you take your next step. But it's like she said, you can't do that living alone. You got to open up. You got to be around people. You got to welcome what God wants to do through people in your life. So please take a moment to do that. Well, folks, for the rest of you, I want to let you know that, like I said, at the end of this service, which is here in just a couple of moments, Despicable Me 3 will be playing up at 180. Grab the kids, go on up for a great time. And don't forget that on July 7th and 8th is our first step in Next Move. So make sure that you have plans to get involved in Next Move. Okay? Wasn't she wonderful tonight? Didn't Angie do a great job? Man, that was fantastic. So proud of you. That was spot on. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a wonderful weekend. God bless you.